Our next topic are derivatives in curved coordinates. Derivatives and curved coordinates. This is going to, we're going to get to a really important concept in uh, general relativity called parallel transport or in uh, tensor calculus called parallel transport. Um, before we go there, let's just talk about derivatives and a curved manifold. So let's, let's just talk about scalar because scalars are relatively straightforward in terms of the mechanics. So let's say F is a scalar. We can ask, how does F change along a particular coordinate direction? And we might write that the partial derivative of F with respect to X alpha, and that just tells us how does F change in a particular direction. Within tensor calculus, we can use uh, a shorthand, which is F comma alpha. All right, so the comma is there to just indicate we're taking a partial derivative. We're taking a partial derivative with respect to x alpha. All right, and so then alpha is just representing the index. I can choose any of the directions. And why did I put alpha downstairs versus upstairs? Well, I put alpha downstairs because this represents the components of a one form. In other words, these partial derivatives transform um, like a covariant one form. They transform in the same way as the basis vector. Okay, that's why I put alpha downstairs. And no, even though I put alpha downstairs and F comma alpha over here on the left, um, the alpha is still on top of the X, but yet it's represented that it's downstairs and it's the denominator. Another way to represent this, these are all just um, ways to represent the same concept with this, which is a partial derivative with respect to X alpha, is to do nabla, the symbol is called nabla, so the thing you're used to associating with a gradient is nabla, nabla sub alpha F. Those represent the components of that one form. And so the gradient are the components of that one form, right? So that's that's how does it, that's how a scalar changes in a curved manifold. Now, what about the derivative of a vector? This is more complicated. And before we get into that, um, I'm going to remind you what we mean by parallel transport, because that's a really important or transporting a vector. That's an important concept. Now, way back in vector analysis, maybe the introduction of vectors, uh, you were taught that if you have two vectors, let's say two vectors in space, and you were gonna add those two vectors, the thing you did to add these two vectors was you moved, let's say we move, we, we're gonna reproduce the top vector. We're gonna move this other vector. Okay, it's, uh, I'm gonna be very specific. It started out here, and now we're gonna move this vector over here like that. And then we're gonna add those together to get this vector here. Yeah. And so, in the process, implicitly, you may have never realized you were doing this, but in the process of doing that addition of the vectors, you moved one of the vectors. And over, in other words, you transported one of the vectors. And I will tell you that um, you have to be careful once your space time is curved and how you do that transportation. It matters. And in fact, noting that how you do the transportation and it matters is one of the main ways we define curvature for space-time. So this, not only do you have to be careful about how you parallel transport, 
But then we can flip that on its head and noting that uh, if there is a difference in the way you transport, we can define curvature with that. Okay, so let me be a little more explicit. And let's say that we have some coordinate system where these lines represent constant x alpha. So x alpha goes in this direction and these lines represent constant x alpha. And let's say there's a vector that points in this direction. And then this vector field, the vector now points, whoops, that was supposed to be a different direction. <laughs> this vector now points in this direction at that location. And, you know, in this space, we have, we have a basis set. Um, let's say we're dealing with two dimensions. We have x1 in that direction and x2 in this direction. And these two vectors represent the basis set in those directions. And so the question is, how does v1, how does the component of v in the first direction change with respect to x1? All right. And another question might be, how does the component of that, that same component change as you go in the x2 direction? And then there's also equivalent questions for the second component. Right. And, and, and you have to be careful about this. Let me, let me show you a very specific example. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, we're going to take a globe. There we go. We'll make that a circle. We're taking a globe and we're going to, our universe is going to be on the surface of this globe. So we can only move around on the surface of this globe. This is the equator of the globe. And here's a pole. And this is a line of longitude that goes from the pole down to the equator. And here's another line. Here's another line of longitude that goes from the equator down to the, uh, goes from the pole down to the equator. All right. Now I'm going to parallel transport um, this vector around this. So let's let's imagine I start with the vector pointing in this direction. All right, and I'm going to parallel transport this vector along this curve. So I'm, in other words, I'm going to try to keep it parallel to something that represents a straight path along this curve or represents uh, in some way, try to make it parallel to where it was before. So I'm gonna use this path to help guide me. All right, so now as I go around this curve, this vector, I'm transporting the vector along the curve and the vector has to live on the manifold on this curved manifold. And so by the time I get up here, the vector is pointing in that direction. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm noticing that this vector is 90 degrees. Let me see, it ends up being 90 degrees to this other longitude. And now I'm gonna transport this vector down along this other longitude such that it maintains that angle. Okay. And now I'm going to, I notice, oh, this vector is parallel with respect to the equator. 
And so I'm gonna transport it back the other direction to where we started, all right? So, and I'm gonna try to make it remain parallel to the equator. And we end up with a vector pointing in this direction. Notice that the vector here and the vector there, so this vector is what we started with, and this vector is what we ended with. There ended up being a rotation of the vector just by parallel transporting the vector around this loop. So how you parallel transport a vector around a manifold matters. We notice that we don't end up with the same vector we started with. And this, this actually is uh, a defining characteristic of whether or not you're in a curved manifold. If you do a parallel transport like this on a closed loop, and you end up with the same vector you started with, then your manifold is not curved and you're in a flat space time. But if you go around the loop and you end up with a different vector, then that is a signature that you're on a curved manifold. And so it's a way to measure the curvature of your manifold. Okay, so that's, that's graphically what's going on when you're trying to trail a uh, parallel transport or what you're trying to do is if you want to take a derivative of a vector across space, you have to compare the vectors across that space. And we just saw how you make that comparison um, matters, how you do that comparison. Here's one particular way in which, in which one would do that. There's one definition for uh, taking a derivative of a vector. In this de definition, um, basically pervert, uh, preserves invariance of physics. And so it's a useful one. So we're gonna take, we're gonna say, we're actually taking the derivative of a vector, not just the components, but the derivative along some direction. So this equals the partial derivative with respect to X beta. Now I'm gonna write this vector in component form. So here are the components, V alpha, and then here's the basis set for a coordinate system, E alpha. All right, so that's the vector. And you notice that we get D uh, partial V alpha with respect to X beta, whoops. x beta times e alpha plus v alpha and then the partial derivative of e alpha with respect to x beta. Now, the, the first term is maybe something you would have expected to show up. Um, the partial of the components with respect to the directions you're going along. And then if you're going to turn that into a vector, you need to multiply by the basis set that you're using. But what you may have not have anticipated, but it should be clear now, is that this derivative of the vector depends upon whether or not the basis set is changing as you're going along this direction as well. So the Cartesian coordinate system does not change. In other words, the flat space time does not change. Um, and so you're not, you're not used to thinking about whether or not you need to worry about whether or not your, your coordinate system is rotating or changing or stretching in some way as you take this derivative. But clearly, just by simple calculus, that term is there. Now, this, let's, let's inspect the, this expression, the partial derivative of the basis vector E alpha partial x beta. Now, note that this is, this is a vector in itself. And it's any vector can be represented by the basis set. All right, so we can, we can say this is equal to um, some coefficients and the basis set. All right, I'm gonna call the coefficient uh, capital gamma, and then I'm, I'm giving myself some room here. We have E 
mu. This is the basis set. Now, because we have mu in the bottom over here and mu does not appear on the left-hand side, we're gonna have to put mu upstairs. And then we have alpha. So over on the left-hand side, we have alpha in the bottom and beta is also in the bottom. So both of these things, this, this thing that alpha represents and the thing that beta represents, represents something that is covariant in its transformation. So the alpha and the beta go in the bottom on this coefficient over here. Okay. So let me let me just plug that in. We're just we're just re-expressing this thing, which is a partial derivative of the basis set, in terms of the base itself, basis set itself. All right. And so let's rewrite this. So apparently the derivative of this vector with respect to x beta is equal to partial v alpha x beta and then e alpha plus v alpha times gamma mu alpha beta and then e mu okay so in this second term we have two dummy indices mu and alpha so alpha is a dummy index and mu is a dummy index because those um, we sum over and beta is the free index. We cannot change beta. Um, the left-hand side has beta, and so the right-hand side needs to have beta. But these other indices are dummy indices, and we have a liberty to change them. And uh, we're, I'm going to use a, a trick that's often used in tensor calculus that allows me to notice that it can collect like terms. So notice the basis, the basis set appears twice here. It appears once there and one's there. And it is not obvious that one can pull out the basis set from this parentheses and just pull it out by itself, but you can. And you do that by switching the, by just renaming the dummy index. All right, so this, I'm gonna do that by partial V alpha DX beta E alpha. I'm not changing that dummy index, but I'm going to swap the alphas and the mu's. So I'll just say mu here and then lambda alpha and then let's see mu beta and then e alpha. Okay. Okay, now the E alpha is the same. And now we can write this as partial V alpha DX beta. And then, uh, whoops, I'm bringing that out. Plus alpha mu beta times E alpha. And this thing that is in the parentheses represents the change in the components of the vector as you go from one place to another in this curve space time. That, this thing that's in the parentheses, oh, whoops, I'm missing a turn. I'm missing something here. V mu. I noticed I was missing that because there was an extra index here that should not be there. So it's like, oh yeah, I'm missing this V mu. Okay, so now this term represents some sort of change in V alpha along a beta direction. 
So it's like a derivative and I'm gonna use the term semicolon. This is called the covariant derivative. And this represents the components of a tensor. So these, so this is an invariant under transformation. This is the, the physics of um, the physics of this is invariant under transformation. Uh, these things, the gamma, alpha, mu, beta, is called the Christoffel symbol. or affine connection coefficient because we used it to help us define the connection along directions in the metric. So Christoffel symbols or affine connection coefficients. And this thing is not a tensor. It's these two things combined together that make a tensor, not the Christoffel symbols by themselves. So they are not invariant. And in other words, these coefficients really do depend upon the coordinate system. Okay, so in terms of nomenclature, we have V alpha semicolon beta represents the components of this tensor. Uh, another way I write it is nabla beta V alpha. This is the same thing. And this represents the components of this tensor. Which represents the gradient of or the change in the vector V. Those are the components of that tensor. And you notice that this is a mixed tensor as alpha upstairs and beta downstairs. Uh, one other thing to note is that what happens if alpha semicolon alpha, what, what are those two, you say that they are equal to one another? Well, this is the divergence and is a scalar. So we're contracting over the indices within this tensor and that gives us the divergence of the velocity or a scalar. And so that's a brief introduction into um, derivatives in a curved coordinate system and a connection to an important concept called parallel transport.